Uh, we are going to turn, if you, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to pick up where we left off. I keep thinking we're going to skip a section here in Isaiah. You know, we're going to get a little bit farther. And so far, we haven't skipped any section. We've gone through every verse, so I guess that is what we'll keep doing. But we're going to be looking at uh, this prophecy. We're in the middle of this prophet, prophetic section where Isaiah is prophesying about the future judgment of the nations. And last week, we looked at the judgment of Babylon and the judgment of Assyria. And now we're going to look to some smaller nations that surround the nation of Israel, particularly uh, Philistia and Moab. So I'm just going to, as we begin this morning, I'm just going to read uh, verse 14 to 28 to 32, just to get us uh, started here with God's word. In the year that King Ahaz died, in the year that King Ahaz died, came this oracle. Rejoice not, O Philistia, Philistia, all of you, that the rod that struck you is broken. For from the serpent's root will come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying serpent, flying fiery serpent. And the firstborn of the poor will graze and the needy lie down in safety. But I will keep your root with famine and your remnant it will slay. But I will kill your root with famine and your remnant it will slay. Wail, O gate, cry out, O city, melt in fear, O Philistia, all of you. For smoke comes out of the north, and there is no straggler in his ranks. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion, and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. Lord, open up this, your word, to our hearts, that we would see it clearly and understand all you have for us. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Philistia and Moab were two nations that uh, joined uh, the nation of uh, Israel or the nation of Judah at this particular time. Philistia would have been on the east. No, I'm sorry. Philistia would have been on the west. Moab would have been on the east. Phil Both of these nations had a long history uh, with the nation of Israel. When Israel came into existence, um, Moab actually uh, were the descendants of Lot. Uh, remember, Abraham is the father of the, uh, of the Jewish nation. Uh, well, Abraham went to Palestine, and he had a relative with him, a nephew by the name of Lot, who went with him. And Lot had two children. One of them's name was Moab. The other was name was Am Amnon. Uh, he had those children by his daughters, which is another sordid story in the book of Genesis. But nevertheless, they were related to Abraham, obviously. And so uh, these people had been around a long time. And if you remember the nation of Israel, when it's leaving Egypt, it sojourns in the land of Moab for a while before eventually crossing the river and going into its own land. But there had been a friendly and not so friendly relationship over the years. Sometimes they were seen as enemies. Sometimes they were seen as friends. Philistia had a similar history with the nation of Israel. Sometimes these, Philistia was the place where people went to for refuge when they wanted to hide away. David ran to Philistia, to the land of the Philistines, when he was trying to run away from Saul. And other times, the Philistines were their enemies. David eventually subdues the Philistines and has a power over the region. But at this particular time in history, they're just another nation. And while they're a small, these two nations are small and insignificant, yet God has a future for them and a plan for them too. And the plan is he's going to bring judgment on their sin and judgment on their rebellion. And so Philistia goes first with these, well, it's only what, one, two, only five verses here at the end of 14. And it says in verse 28 that this oracle happens when Ahaz dies. Ahaz is the king we learned about at the very beginning of Isaiah, the king that wanted to align himself with the other nations in order to protect himself uh, from the coming, um, the coming Assyrian or the coming uh, threat from the north. Um, and Ahaz by this time has died. And so it says in verse 29, to rejoice not, O Philistia, 
that the rod that struck you is broken. Now, somebody else dies too in verse 29, but it's not real clear whether that person who dies in verse 29, the rod that struck you is a reference to some foreign power. It's not clear whether that's Ahaz or whether that's some, someone from the Assyrian uh, nation who had pestered Philistia for a good while and eventually would overcome the Philistines and take the nation over. But nevertheless, the point is that the Philistines are sitting there and they're thinking they got it made because whoever they perceive to be their enemy, whether it's Ahaz or whether it's some king or ruler of Assyria, that person has died. And now that he's died, we've got it made. We're going to be safe. We're going to be secure. Everything's going to be fine. You know, do you ever... We kind of have that same mentality, don't we? We sort of say to ourselves, if, if the guy that's ruling us just gets voted out of office or if, or if the person, that's the country that's threatening, threatening us just ceases to exist, then everything will be fine and everything will be okay. And what God says here through the prophet Isaiah to the Philistines is it's not going to be okay just because this person has died. In fact, what's going to happen is it, he, he says, uh, in the rest of 29, he says, from the serpent's root will come forth an adder, and from its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. In other words, you think you got rid of one problem, but from the root of that problem is going to come an even greater problem. From the serpent's root will come an adder. You're going to have another enemy, and that enemy is going to be worse than the first. And the firstborn of the poor, in verse 30, is a reference. The firstborn of the poor will graze and the needy will lie down in safety, which is saying that the needy and the poor are going to be okay. But you're not going to be okay because the rest of the verse says, I will kill your root with famine and your remnant, it will slay. So this person has died, whoever this is, this person has died yet from this empire, from is going to come another enemy and that enemy is going to slay you and it's going to be harder on you than you think this other enemy is going to be. And so verse 31, he tells the Phil Philistines to wail. Wail, O gate. The city gate was the, the center of the city, where well, not the center of the city, but it was the center of commerce, the center of power, the center of politics. So when it talks about the city gate, it's talking about the whole city, and it's saying, Wail, O city gate, O, uh, o gate, cry out, O city, melt in fear, O Philistia, all of you. For smoke comes out of the north, and there is no straggler in his ranks. The smoke is, is no doubt a reference to the Assyrian Empire, which was to the north. The Assyrians were going to come down. They were going to conquer from the north. They were going to burn the cities as they came. The smoke would go up from the cities, and he said, look, your destruction is going to come from the north. And then in verse 32, what will one answer? The messengers of the nation. Now, the messengers of the nation is a little bit obscure here. These are either Israelite messengers going to Philistia trying to consult or they're Philisti Philistines coming somewhere else looking for comfort. But, here, but here's the point of it. The point of it is the Lord has founded Zion and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. Zion is a name for the people of God and where they dwell. Uh, sometimes the city of Zion would be Jerusalem, right? The nation of Zion would be Judah, or sometimes the whole nation of Israel. And so the point here, the, the key point in this whole text is this, that the Lord has founded Zion, and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. In other words, God is going to protect Zion. He's going to protect his people. Philistia is going to come under judgment and be wiped off the map, essentially. But God's people will endure so if you want to seek refuge, if you want to seek safety, and you're an Israelite, do you look to Philistia? You don't look to, the, you don't look to Philistia. Why? Because Philistia is going to face judgment like all these other eight nations are. <clears throat> you look to Zion because Zion is where God's people are. And Zion is where God is. And the people of Zion are the people that God is going to protect. Don't look to the Philistines to find your salvation. Look to God who is in Zion. That's the point of it there. Now that's Philistia. Now the whole thing's going to change in verses chapters 15 and 16. And Isaiah is now going to address the nation of Moab. It's the rather long, well, actually the chapters are relatively short. We're going to go through them quickly. Let's begin with verse 1, verse chapter 15. An oracle concerning Moab. 
Now there's gonna, I'll warn you ahead of time, there's gonna be a list of a lot of cities and towns that you have no idea what they are or where they are, and that's okay because a lot of Bible scholars don't know where they are either. A lot of these are, towns are identifiable, but not all of them. But they're all towns from the land of Moab. Because of Ar of Moab, because Ar of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. Because Kerr of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. He has gone up to the temple and to Dibon, to the high places, to weep. And over Nebo and over Mediba, Moab wails. On every head is boldness. Every beard is shorn. Um, the reference there in verse 2, he has gone up to the temple. The temple will be the temple of the, uh, the Moabite god, the Moabs, the Moabites wor worship the god called Chemosh. And Chemosh uh, is worshiped on these high altars, these high places in temples, and that's a reference to Moab's going up to their temple, they're gonna plea for help, right? And to Debon and to the high places, the Debon would have been a city, and then what are they gonna do? They're gonna weep. They're gonna weep over Nebo, which was a town. Nebo was also a mountain. Um, and over Mediba, Moab whale. So we're weeping over these cities that are starting to fall and these cities are going to be conquered. And they're going into mourning and that's why they shave their heads with bold, boldness is a reference to mourning and shaved heads and shaved beards as well would be a reference to mourning. They're mourning verse three in the streets. They wear sackcloth on the housetops and in the squares. Everyone wails and melts in tears. Heshbon and Ella cry out, their voice is heard as far as Jahaz. Therefore, the armed men of Moab cry aloud, his soul trembles. Now, notice that the, the destruction is so bad that even the soldiers are crying. In the end of verse 4, the armed men of Moab cry aloud. You know, usually the soldiers are the ones that have the, they don't weep at anything. Nothing bothers them, they're soldiers, right? But the destruction is so bad here in Moab that even the armed men are crying out. And in verse 5, my heart cries out for Moab. Now, this is extraordinary because Isaiah didn't do a whole lot of weeping for Babylon when Babylon fell, and he didn't do a whole lot of weeping for Assyria. But now Moab, all of a sudden, Isaiah gets a little teary-eyed himself because the destruction is so devastating. My heart cries out for Moab. Her fugitives flee to Zor, to Iglath, Shalishia, for at, the, uh, for at the ascent of Luhith, they go up weeping on the road to Horonim. They raise a cry of destruction. Notice uh, the language here. This is a lament. You can tell it's a lament because there are lots of wails, wailing, weeping, uh, crying, um, and so on. That language is all throughout this chapter 15 and even into chapter 16. Um, the waters of Nimrim are, desol uh, are desolation in verse 6. The grass is withered and the vegetation fails. The greenery is no more. Normally, Nimrim had these springs that would feed the valleys. They were flush with vegetation, but what's happening? This is, uh, this is a poetic way of saying that the nation is being uh, destroyed. Uh, it, it's, it's, it just puts it in agricultural terms. Even, even our fields are now desolate. Our, our fertile fields are no more. Therefore, the abundance they have gained in verse 7 and what they have laid up, they carry away. They would be the fugitives that would be running away from the encroaching armies. What they have laid up, they carry away over the brook of the willows. Um, if you've ever seen, you've seen pictures of this, I'm sure. Um, uh, there will be a war that will break out somewhere and immediately all the citizens begin to flee and they take whatever they have, whatever they can carry, and they, on whatever they can carry it, on their cars, on their donk, ox carts, on their, on their donkeys, on whatever they can get, they pile into their, all their possessions they can get, they pile into their, their, their means of transport and they begin to try to take it away. And that's what verse 7 is a picture of. The abundance they have gained, it's ultimately going to be carted away. And usually it gets abandoned because by the time you get to where you're going, you, you can no longer carry it. Verse 8, for a cry has gone around the land of Moab. Her wailing reaches uh, Eglim and her wailing reaches Bir Alim. For the waters of Dibon are full of blood. For I will bring upon Dibon even more 
a lion for those of Moab who escape, for the remnant of the land. In other words, in verse 9, um, Dibon is actually a play on words. In Hebrew, it sounds like blood. It was a city, but uh, it's a diff- spelled differently. Uh, Isaiah appears to be um, playing on the words, and he said, you know, you're, you're coming to a place of blood, but there's going to be, uh, but there's going to be more blood. You, you, you think you're going to escape bloodshed, but you're actually going to run into more bloodshed. Uh, you, you, a lion for those of Moab who escape. In other words, you think you're escaping one danger, but you're running into a completely new danger. That's how devastating this is going to be. So it's a lament here in verse 15 that God's bringing this horrible situation on the people of Moab. And even Isaiah laments in verse 5 when he cries out. Now here's the interesting question about verse 5. Is it Isaiah who is weeping for the people of Moab? Or is it God? Who is weeping over Moab? You don't know in chapter 15. But by the time we get three quarters of the way through chapter 16, we know. So let's keep going. Verse 1 from chapter 16. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah by way of the desert to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Now, sending lambs was a typical way the tribute was was taken to a new king. And so what is being implied here, um, this may even be advice that's been given, or this this may be the people of Moab saying, this is what we're going to do, but we're going to send a lamb, we're going to send tribute to some other king who can protect us and save us. And who is that king? Or who is that nation? Well, they're going to send it to the Mount of the Daughter of Zion. Mount of Zion would have been Jerusalem. So what they're saying is, let's send tribute to Jerusalem so we can find refuge and protection from them. Verse 1. And then verse 2 is similar to that, like fleeing birds. It describes the people that are fleeing their nation. Like fleeing birds, like a scattered nest, so are the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. At the fords of Arnon was where they were going to cross, and uh, they were going to escape the danger and then hopefully get to Israel. So it's just a picture of people fleeing like birds uh, from a scattered nest. It's people fleeing the danger. But where are they going? To the mount of the daughter of Zion in verse 1. Now, verses 3, 4, and 5 are either the words of the prophet Isaiah giving counsel to Israel, or they're the daughters that are fleeing again, saying, what do we do? And, and, and so here's what they're, they're pleading for. Give counsel, grant justice, make your shade like night at the height of noon, Shelter the outcast, do not reveal the fugitive. Now what this is, is this is a plea to the people of Israel that they would shelter the outcast and they would shelter the refugees. You know, Jeff Morris works for um, an organization that is designed to bring immigrants into the United States and help them get settled, help them get shelter, help them. And many of the people that come through the organization are fleeing desperate situations in their own nation. They're fleeing war, they're fleeing uh, economic poverty or drought or or starvation, all kinds of other things. And um, this is biblical to help people who are in times of great need to help them and shelter them. And so that's what the cry is for in verse 3. Give us shade. Give us shelter. Shelter us like, if, shelter us like it's dark in the, in the heat of the day. Shelter us from the, the burning sun, the burning situation that we find ourselves in, which in the case of Moab, the burning situation is they're under attack. And in verse 4 continues that, let the outcast of Moab sojourn among you, be a shelter to them from the destroyer when the oppress and we'll stop there. Be a shelter to them from the destroyer. And then shade us, protect us, give us shelter, give us comfort. Now all of a sudden, this little mood changes here in verse in the middle of verse four, and somebody else is speaking in this voice. When the oppressor is no more, and destruction has ceased, when your enemy is no more, when your enemy's been done away with, when the war's over. And he who tramples underfoot has vanished from the land. Your enemy is no longer there. Look at verse 5. 
then a throne will be established in steadfast love and on it will sit in faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. Now you see what's being said there. Flee to Zion. And when your enemy is gone, what will you find in Zion? You will find the Messiah. Because that's what it's a reference to. You will find the one from the tent of David, from the house of David. The one who's been promised long ago. And what will this one bring you? He will bring justice. He will bring righteousness. And he will bring faithfulness. All the stuff that we've been reading about from Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 6, or rather Isaiah 6, Isaiah 9 rather, verse 6, where it says, For unto us a, son, a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The stuff we've been reading from Isaiah chapter 11, where it talks about there shall come forth from a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear. His delight shall be in the, in the law of the Lord, and with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And we talked about last week, the other week, about how this one is clothed in righteousness. He has the belt of righteousness around him, and, and he has the outer cloaking of righteousness and the under cloak of righteousness. This Messiah, this King, this is what you will find when you eventually get to Zion. A refuge from the storm. Now, I want to get back to verse 5, but let's finish the rest of the chapter quickly. We have heard of the pride of Moab, how proud he is. Again, God always addresses pride, and this is no exception here when it comes to this nation. It's a proud nation. We've heard of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence. In his idle boasting, he is not right. Therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. Let everyone wail, mourn, utterly stricken for the raising cakes of Kir uh, Harsheth. For from the fields of Hesh, for the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Sibna, the lords of the nations have struck down its branches, which reached to Jazir and strayed to the desert. Its shoots spread abroad and passed over the sea. That's describing the, this, this expansive nation that, that stretched all the way. And look what's look what's coming to this great expanse. Destruction is coming everywhere. Therefore. I will weep with the weeping of Jazir in verse 9 for the vine of Sibma. I drench you with my tears, O Heshbon, O Ella, for over your summer fruit and over your harvest the shout has ceased. In other words, again, this is an agriculture, this is a picture, a poetic agricultural picture of the, of the harvest ceasing. No more rejoicing over harvest. Why? Because the nation has been destroyed. I drench my tears, so I read that. And in verse 10, and, uh, and joy and gladness are taken away from the uh, fruitful field. And in the vineyards, no songs are sung, no cheers are raised, no, tr no treader threads, uh, treads out wine in the presses. And then look at this. I have put an end to the shouting. Now, who's the I? Who put an end to the shouting of Moab? Well, it's God, it's Yahweh. But look at the very next phrase, therefore my inner parts moan like a liar for Moab and my inmost self for Kiris Hareth. It is God, according to verse 10 and 11, who is mourning for Moab. The unjust, the unrighteous, the proud nation that comes under the judgment of God, God mourns the destruction of Moab. Do you realize how profound that is? That the God of the Old Testament, you know, you, you get this picture that the God of the Old Testament, he's just mean and he's just vindictive and he's got his clock is wound a little bit too tight. He's about, he's about ready to blow at any instant. And it's totally opposite of the case. 
God is ready to break out in mercy and compassion. If any clock is wound tight in God, it's his mercy and compassion. But his justice, his judgment is slow in coming. And when it comes, he feels the weight of it. He feels the pain of it. He feels the loss of it. When God judges people, God feels the weight of that sin on himself. You know, you, you know, we have a tendency to say, oh, my sin is just between, it's just me. It doesn't affect anybody else. And that's a big lie. Your sin affects lots of other things. It affects your family. It affects your neighborhood. It affects your nation. It affects your friends. And here's the thing. It affects God. God is affected by your sin. That's the teaching of the Old Testament, and it's the teaching of the New Testament. But in the New Testament, we have it in a far more powerful picture. Because we have God himself bearing the sins of the world on the cross. There he feels the weight. And there he feels the burden of his own judgment. And so God brings judgment to Moab. And justly and righteously so. But when he brings it, he mourns. He weeps. He wails. Let's finish up and verse 12. And when Moab presents himself, when he wearies himself on the high places, they're going to, Moab's going to go to these, their false god in these high places. And when he comes to his sanctuary to pray, he will not prevail. Why? Because he's going to the wrong god. He's not praying to Yahweh. He's praying to his own gods. And they're not true gods at all. Verse 13, this is the word that the Lord spoke concerning Moab in the past, but now the Lord has spoken, saying, In three years, like the years of a hired worker, the glory of Moab will be brought into contempt in spite of all his great multitude, and those who remain will be very few and feeble. Uh, in other words, Isaiah is saying, or God is saying, look, I've been saying this for years that this is going to happen in Moab, but now I'm telling you it's going to happen within three years. Within three years as a hired worker, a hired uh, worker or an enslaved worker, which is, this is a reference to, would be counting off the days uh, until he's finished his three-year obligation. And so what it basically is saying, look, you can put it on a calendar within three years, this is going to happen to Moab. Now, let's go back to, the, to verse 5. I, 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 um, I don't know what I titled this. in the. I, I think I left this title out of the bulletin. I think I just called the, 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 uh, this title Philistia and Moab or something obscure like that. What this message is really about is the refuge of Philistia and Moab. Where did the people of Philistia find refuge when they're in trouble? Well, they're not going to find it in their country. They're going to have to go to Zion. And where do the people in Moab find refuge when their country is under siege? Well, they're not going to find it in their country. They're going to have to find it in Zion. And the reason they're going to find it in Zion is because that's where Yahweh is. That's where the compassionate God is. That's where the mighty God is. That's where the true God is. God's refuge Verse 1432 is in Zion. The Lord has founded Zion, and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. And in 16 verse 5, the throne will be established in steadfast love, and on it will sit in faithfulness the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. The nation of Philistia and Moab would not last the gods of those nations would be forgotten. Do you know any worshipers of Shemesh today? Or maybe Dagon. Dagon would have been the god of the Philistines. Do you know anybody worshiping those gods today? You probably can't even find these places on a map. At least most people can't even find these places on the map. They've long since faded from our maps. And yet, 2,700 years later, there are still people worshiping Yahweh. There are still people looking for these promises of the Davidic Messiah to come to all of its fullness and all of its completeness. All the other gods, all the other nations have vanished, but the people of Zion still remain to this day. So when somebody comes to tear down your world, when destruction or chaos comes into your life, when somebody comes to invade your city, who are you going to turn to? 
Are you going to turn to politics? Are you going to turn to your financial bank account? Are you going to turn to medicine or science or technology? Or maybe you're just going to pick up and leave and move to a new country. Are you going to find security there? And the point of these texts is that there is no security outside of looking to God, of following Yahweh, of worshiping the one true God. And in fact, the Messiah has already come. The root of David has already come into this world. And he has already bought, as we have talked about earlier, he has already brought righteousness and he has already brought justice and he has already brought peace and he has already brought eternal life. And he will bring more of it when he comes again. But initially, he has already fulfilled what has been spoken of in that sense already here. We live on this side of the cross, and therefore, we have no excuse at looking to other things, at looking to other people, at looking to other nations, at looking to politics to save us from whatever we think we're in danger of. We have no excuse except to look to one, the true God and his Messiah, Jesus Christ. There's an interesting thing about the language here from verse 5 about the tent of David. David had a father by the name of Jesse. Jesse had a father by the name of Obed. Obed had a father by the name of Boaz. But what is significant is Boaz's wife and the father of Obed was Ruth. Ruth was from the land of Moab. And in Moab, she left Moab. You know why she left Moab? Because her life had fallen apart. She had married an Israelite, but he had died. Her father-in-law had died. Her brother-in-law had died. There was nobody left. She's a widower in the land of Moab. And her mother-in-law, Naomi, wants to return back to her homeland, to return to Judah. And Naomi says, or Ruth says rather, I'm going to go with you. Your, your people from now on will be my people. Your God will be my God. And I will settle in the land of strangers where I will find refuge and where I will find comfort, where I will find Yahweh, the true God. And when she moved back to the land of Judah, she found a husband by God's providence by the name of Boaz, who was a righteous man and a good man. And she was able to marry again, and for the first time she was able to have children. And not only did she have a child, but she had a child that would lead to the coming Messiah because she found refuge in Moab. My point is, there is refuge when we turn to Yahweh when we turn from the things that we think we're going to find comfort and strength and security in, and we turn our hearts to the one true God and to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, there is blessing, there is refuge, and there is everything we can possibly imagine. And that's what these verses call me to. On the one hand, they're a message to the nation of Israel in the historical context to not trust in Philistia or not trust in Moab to save you. But on a much greater level, they're a reminder for all of us to trust and to look to the one true God who will indeed bless us if we surrender to him, if we look to him. And the reason we know that is because this true God has already given his life for us on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great reminder this morning that all that we need and all that we have comes in you. You truly are our God, and you are our salvation, and you are our peace. So remind us of that this morning as we partake in this supper. Encourage us and set apart these elements so that they will feed our spiritual souls and remind us of this blessed King who has come into the world to save us and to redeem us. In Jesus' name, amen.